intervention in terms of getting teaching and learning ongoing uh, relative to even schools being closed has to do with the use of uh, uh, the internet, technology. the technology. technology, so to speak. Mm -hmm. And when it comes to technology, I would say that uh, to a reasonable extent, uh, based on my experience, at the university level, it's been ongoing, and as to whether its effectiveness can be measured now depends on uh, when the students are back and when they are even made to take exams and all those kind of things. Mm -hmm. I don't know much about the, the, the primary level because... Uh, at the primary level, there was an educational TV channel as Ghana Learning TV as a provisional measure to yes, address... Yes, and, and even beyond that, I have had experiences where uh, my kids have been sent... Uh, assignments to do at home through WhatsApp. So there's, there's some level of evidence when it comes to technology being used. But the truth of the matter is that when it comes to teaching and learning, there's no way that you'll be able to have uh, the most efficient technological means of teaching, especially when situated within our social cultural environment. And uh, if you realize before we left, uh, I indicated that even instances where just the commonest means of uh, communicating through technology, which is WhatsApp. Mm -hmm. You have students who, who do not have access to it. I've had instances where final year students, you put information on the platform, and you have people calling to, to source that information because they do not have access to what? The internet, or they do not have access to, to uh, uh, technology. Uh, so if uh, I should sum it up in terms of how effective it's been, I think this is the only option that uh, we have in terms of the, uh, the situation that we find ourselves. Could there have been a better option than, uh, than, than that? I, I, I don't know. Uh, will there be the need for, for uh, a top-up in terms of uh, teaching and learning taking place? It depends on the, the, the environment, and I think it should be a case-by-case -case study uh, basis because, uh, as, as you are aware, uh, final year students in the various universities are being asked to come back come to back. school, even though teaching and learning uh, from my position was ongoing. Uh, there, there is, there, there is mm -hmm. definitely well, going the University to be of Ghana, for example, has decided to go ahead, continue its that, that uh, is online. It. Definitely, there, there are going to be instances where some students were, were left out. Uh, will this provide them the opportunity for them to, to catch up? I think, uh, I think yes. Mm -hmm. So. Uh, in terms of how effective it is, I, I wouldn't say it's been uh, uh, excellent, but I wouldn't also say that it's been a failure, especially when you situate it within our, our, our environmental context. And it's a fact. So if we're supposed to be learning to live with the virus and improving on these interventions going forward, what should we be paying attention to? With these interventions, both the basic, secondary, and tertiary levels, during this period. Good, uh, thank you for inviting me for the discussion. You know, uh, we are in a crisis, but the thing about crisis is that it also offers opportunities. Uh, for example, when I was teaching in the US, as far back as in the 1980s, we were using computers. Uh, here, we are being forced to do things that are new. But I'll tell you, going forward in education period in the 21st century, the challenge for every country is how we can educate the greatest number of people with the least means of uh, people standing in front of you doing the face-to-face -face thing. There's something to be said for teaching on the face-to-face -face level. You want to see the emotions of the person. You want to connect to the students. You want to see their understanding and that sort of thing. So there's a place for that. Mm -hmm. But going forward, though, we cannot underestimate the power of aud audiovisual means we cannot uh, underestimate the power of even using the radio, using television, and using some of the social media. Now, what we have to begin to understand is this. How are we now raising, now if, if, let, let's look at the public schools for example. We have about 300,000 teachers in the system. How do we bring them up to speed? Because that's very important. And then I always related to me growing up, for example. Uh, I went to school in France, where well, for four years, I was studying French. But I could never speak it. No, no, we do no. subject verb agreement, singular, plural, and that sort of thing. But now, with the internet facilities, you can speak the language in six months. So for the four years, had they even doubled the, uh, the duration f uh, into eight years, we still will not be able to speak it. That's one way to look at it. And also even with music. 
I'm talking about how things are changing. Mm -hmm. And what the COVID-19 is doing is that it's opening our mind wide open to the possibilities. The same with music, for example. Again, I studied music in school for about four years. I couldn't even play a simple instrument. These days, you can get access to the means to play guitar, to play a flute, all of that. But again, I want to go back to what my brother was saying in terms of making it accessible mm -hmm. to everybody else. Now, we don't need to be discouraged because this thing is new. But what we need now is a critical mass of people who are really in tune with how we want to use technology. You know? so, and then uh, the other thing is this. I look at my own situation again. As a teacher, I've been teaching most of my adult life. Mm -hmm. Even before COVID-19, I was using the, uh, the internet teaching a course in a medical school called Creative and uh, Critical Thinking. And internet makes it very easy. For example, in medical school, let's say you are studying the, uh, you want to be a brain surgeon. Mm -hmm. One of the first things that you do is, is to find out how does the brain work. Now, where can you get that information? It's from the internet. You don't need a face-to-face -face interaction for that. What are the diseases associated with the brain? You can find information on the internet. Uh, uh, what are the preventive measures in terms of preventing the disease, diseases of the brain? It's also on the internet. Mm -hmm. And then it comes to the procedures, invasive and non-invasive procedures. And that, that's where you go to YouTube. Mm -hmm. And you, I mean, what you do is that you do what you call a guided practice. You show young people exactly what the expectations are because you want to be learner-centered people. You don't want them to be unduly dependent on this face-to-face -face interaction. Now, the, uh, I want to cut this short. Mm -hmm. Now, when you go on YouTube, you can see the, uh, how the invasive procedures are done in India, in Canada, mm -hmm. in the United States, right. in Europe, and so on. So what the kids do, and this is brilliant, huh? Mm -hmm. What they do is this, they listen to it. But then when, that's what we call flipping. They listen to it. But when they come back to the classroom, they are not going to sit and listen to teachers anymore. Now they, the show is, is theirs where you now mute uh, the, the YouTube, and then you speak to it, mm. like a, a, a professional medical doctor. You, know, you have the names of the instruments and so on. So what I'm saying is this. Mm. Look, when I was growing up, population of Ghana was 6 million. Now it's about 30. So how do we address all of them? What COVID-19 is showing us is that now we have to begin to kick in something that is extraordinary, but it's not impossible. Mm -hmm. So even though we have these challenges where we don't have internet access to everybody else, we need a critical mass of educators who can make a difference in the country. You know, and, and it's the right kind of approach to ensure that we don't miss out on the lessons that COVID-19 will leave us with. That's what really is a co of concern because we've had instances where things have happened well, and we're expected to learn and, and, and have a learning curve, at least, and implement policies that would ensure that we improve on those instances and we miss out on those opportunities. So, at this point, and I'm still looking at the uh, what interventions over the period. So, for example, we mentioned access, accessibility and monitoring. The fact that there's teaching going on on television or on radio does not necessarily mean that the child will go and sit behind it to, to listen. How do we do this going forward? Because if we have to live with it, these things probably will be considered going forward. Yeah. Thank you very much for inviting me here. Yeah, I'm happy to, to comment on accessibility and monitoring. My colleague spoke about accessibility and indeed accessibility is quite of a challenge for most of our children who live beyond the reach of um, mm. technology. And when it comes to monitoring, the parents have now become teachers. Mm -hmm. During the lockdown, most of the parents were at home so they could assist their children in doing their work or even ensuring that they watch the programs that um, were being aired on TV, the lessons that were being taught. But now that um, the restrictions are, have been lightened and the parents have to go to work, Monitoring whether your child is doing the work or not has been a challenge for most of the parents because the teachers who otherwise would have been in school to make sure, and I speak to the basic level, mm -hmm. the teachers who would have been in school to make sure children are doing their work, paying attention to lessons, doing their classwork, are no more there. And now the owners lies on parents to become teachers. And it's become a little difficult 
for most parents to perform that act, especially when they have to go to work. And for parents who have two, three, four children, it's even more difficult if they have to use the internet, they have one laptop. So accessibility is, is quite a major issue here. Mm -hmm. Let me go on to Zoom now and connect with Professor uh, George K. T. Odro, who's the Dean of Educational Development and Outreach, University of Cape Coast, uh, for his thoughts on this. Doc, uh, Prof, I want to thank you for joining us uh, via Zoom. I seek your thoughts first off on uh, now we know that this process, uh, the interventions had challenges prior to this moment. What kind of thinking approach should the ministry and the Ghana Education Service have for the way forward? So good morning. Uh, thanks. Thank you, uh, listeners. Yeah, um, I did not get your question well. Uh, what are, are you asking? I didn't get your question well. Oh, okay. So, pro, pro, is it better now? Can you hear me? Hear Great. I was asking about the fact now we know that the interventions during the lockdown period well, prior to the first phase of the easing of restrictions had challenges. So what kind of thinking approach should the education authorities, Ministry of Education, Ghana Education Service have for the way forward in improving on these interventions that were in place? Uh, I cannot talk for the Minister of Education. Actually, yeah, but I think that the ministry, and for that matter, the Ghana Education Service, uh, did well in ensuring that learning and teaching uh, did not break as well. Okay. Professor Do, we're, we're getting we're getting feedback from you where you are. Um, if it's possible to mute any other sound where you are, that would help. Uh, Okay, so so while you do that, um, let me also welcome uh, Zakaria Suleimana, who is uh, the regional rep for uh, that's uh, Oxfam. He's going to be joining us for Zoom, getting to it shortly. We will we'll get back into it and then also get their thoughts on this. But uh, and it's, th that's th that's actually brings us to the point about the approach. It's always been the case. I mean, we need to get it right if we're starting the process of thinking through sustaining these measures as part of our educational curriculum. Right. You know, to be honest with you, uh, when there's a crisis like what we have now, we need to pay attention to the opportunities that are open. Mm -hmm. And what I'm suggesting is this. You know, uh, we have to give a lot of uh, credit to the president who's leading us in this particular era. Nobody ever expected it. I never expected it to be here talking on, on TV, wearing a mask, which is uncomfortable. <laughs> but we have been uh, led into a different terrain altogether. What I'm suggesting is this. A again, the challenges that uh, my, buddy, my brother here is beginning to identify for us, we have to begin to understand that this country is not the, uh, under the peer view of only one or two people. Mm -hmm. What I'm suggesting is that we need to now pull in corporate social responsibility. For example, why do we uh, have major uh, stakeholders who are computer savvy or who are internet savvy like the, uh, the service providers. Yeah. They, they need to come in. Mm -hmm. And then what I'm saying is this, we cannot pretend that we don't have a crisis, we do. So what I'm saying is every corporation should be in a position where they adopt a school. That look, we are now coming to bring in some of our own best practices mm -hmm. in the school itself. And what I'm saying is, is this something that I've seen done elsewhere? Where, for example, if there are difficulties in the school acquiring particular things, we pull in corporations so they begin to partner with the schools. This is where we find ourselves now, that everyone, everyone should be part of the solution. You know, my sister was talking about parents, and then the other thing is this. In our time, parents were kind of aloof, that the dependence was only on teachers mm -hmm. to educate their children. Mm -hmm. Things have changed. If you're a parent now, and you are not a computer savvy, it's good to take a course in it. You know, mm. we can't pretend that we don't know it. Everybody can participate in some way. We can't say that the whole country will be able to do it. But even if 10% of the parents are doing it, the next year, another 10%, this is where we go forward in this. But I'll tell you this. The sad part is where this is a digital generation, mm -hmm. and we have analog teachers in the system. 
I mean, it's speaking to us. Frankly, had it not been for COVID-19, a lot of these issues would still be buried. But now it's wide open, and we really have to live up to the challenges. And the other thing is this. Now, when we even begin to look at the leadership of the public schools themselves, we can't do it the way it was done when I was growing up. Uh, you, you need to walk into a, part, a public school, for example. Forget about the villages, right here in Accra. Mm -hmm. You need to walk there and, and, and tell yourself that this is an oasis of excellence. And that's what I mean. If, for example, a lot of the kids that we have in our public schools don't have toilet facilities at home, when they come to the school, they need to have toilet facilities there. Mm. And we are not speaking the vacuum. This is how Lee Kuan Yew raised children in Singapore. He said, look, your parents raise pigs and uh, chickens in their, uh, in, in their environment. I can't change the parents. But what I can do is that I can change you as a student. So mm -hmm. every school in Singapore at the time, in the 60s, about the same time as us, became the oasis of excellence where children have uh, a particular meaning to life, where you can have, have access to the toilet, <coughs> where you can have access to the toilet paper and so on. And then they went home to change their mothers and fathers and but, grandfathers. But, but, this is the situation the, the, which we find ourselves These now. requirements exist already. I mean, how can you put up a school and not have decent toilet facilities? They're there. They're requirements. If you're putting up a school, the problem is with effective monitoring to ensure that these, you know, things are in place. And that's where we are now. And that's, if you're talking about the fact that, yes, it has to be in place, it is already there, but is it in place? That, that, that's a good question. Okay. The school that I went to in Kumasi, St. Peter's School, in, in, the, uh, in 1957, I was 10 years old when Ghana became independent. We use what we call the bomber latrine. Up to today, there are no toilets there. But the wow. issue is this. Again, when you begin to look at PTAs, parent-teacher organizations, the question that every person should ask themselves is this. You know, I don't want us to be in a position where we are pointing fingers at other people. We should be in a position to point fingers at ourselves. Here I am. I have about three children who are going to a particular school. And you know that there are no toilets there. How can you be aloof? You know, what I'm saying is this. This is an area where everybody needs to be seen as part of the solution. You know, mm -hmm. we can, the excuse we always have is that we expect someone else to do it. But if nobody else is doing it, then we need to have pressure groups, PTAs, teachers, organizations that are now monitoring everything. We can't just pretend there's one or two people who are supposed to do these things. And this is what I'm also saying, that it would be a very good idea now for corporations to begin to adopt schools so and see done. if they can match them with the same excellence that they do in the, uh, in the corporations. This mm. is a, a situation now that, that demands that everybody should be part of the solution. Let me bring in Joseph Achuhomaji, who, who is the Interim National Chair of the Ghana National Education Company Coalition. Mr. Maji, can you hear me? Good morning to you. Yeah, I can hear you. Now, I know you've been following the conversation now. and, and we're, we're, we're talking about going forward. What has to be done to sustain the interventions that have been put in place uh, to help teaching and learning during COVID-19? I'll find out your thoughts on this, sir. Yeah, thank you very much. Good morning to your viewers. Uh, in fact, the interventions, that the e-learning interventions for, 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 for the school children, uh, which is good. However, like uh, my colleagues are saying, it has a lot of uh, limitation as far as children with special needs are concerned. For example, I, I commend genius for when they were doing their thing on the program, uh, there is a sound language interpreter interpreting it to the deaf. But what about the blind? What about low vision? They don't have access. We are talking about access and monitoring. They don't have access to this kind of learning on the, on the TV because some of them even are in the rural areas. And even the subject they are teaching, how can they? Because for the blind or for persons with you have to modify the methodology. So mm. they have difficulty in access the actual information as far as the e-learning is concerned. Most of them also don't have the skills in the in the in the, in the IT. Mm. So it has a lot of limitations. And like we are all discussing, these children must also be brought on board when we have we have, we have developed the package. The, the framework for Ghanaian children 
then special children with special needs must be taken on board. For example, children with low vision, they are in the setting, a, a inclusive education setting, schools. Those children need large brains. We have to cater for them. We have to give them the skills in ICT so that they can, they can also be, be accessing the information as far as the e-learning is concerned. So it's a huge limitation, but because you see, it's a new phenomenon. We are now starting. So it is good we have this national conversation so that the policymakers and together with all of us, all the stakeholders, we put our heads together and develop a framework that will be inclusive so that every Ghanaian child is, catered or is, catered, is brought on board. No child should be left out. So, so th these are the things. But moving forward, like I said, we, we, uh, Ghana Education, Ghana, Ghana Education National Coalition com, uh, uh, campaign, we have source funding. We have source funding from ISUA, and we are trying to partner with, or we are partnering with uh, Ghana Education Service. Mm. We are developing braille copies, braille copies for the blind students. Wow. We are doing that right now. And we are also uh, developing large prints for the low vision students. And even the covert education, we are also developing material, braille material to cover that so that they can access the information on COVID education. They can access the content of the e-learning program. So that's what we are doing together with Genius right now. And my organization, my coalition is doing that so mm. that we can bring every child on board. No child should be left out. So this is what we are doing moving forward. We are saying that all of us should come together so that we develop the framework, like I said earlier, we develop the materials, we develop so that accessibility be possible for, for every child. No child should be left out. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for this and it's good to know that there's already some work ongoing in that regard to ensure that we're able to uh, get all the people in place to uh, get the right things moving. Uh, Zakaria Suleimana uh, is with Oxford. I'm going to come to him uh, on this as well. But on that point uh, that um, he, he made, about the inclusion, especially with, with children with various uh, disabilities and the proposals that you're making. If these and other interventions made are to be continued, what are some of the other things that we can do to improve on the process? Well, I think uh, 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 what we are looking at and in terms of uh, uh, the topic being put forward is uh, basic education framework, COVID-19 and beyond. And uh, as we speak now, we haven't even gotten out of COVID-19. Mm -hmm. uh, schools are shut down. And um, you're listening to uh, contributions from uh, most people here and even outside. Mm -hmm. it, it, it tells you that uh, our educational system or educational infrastructure needs to be improved. Mm -hmm. It tells you the shortfalls that we have in terms of our educational infrastructure. For instance, technology is now the most attractive tool uh, when it comes to teaching and learning as being espoused by Mr. Anis. But the truth of the matter is that even in this studio, uh, you could see the challenges that we were facing in terms of technology. True. I mean, just Zoom. Professor Drew had to be... Beginners. Yes, mm -hmm. Professor Drew had to be taken up because of technology. The truth of the matter is that in this country, we have schools, a lot of schools, where we don't even have tables and chairs. We don't have uh, chalk. In fact, we talk about COVID-19 and beyond. Most parents, most parents had mortgaged the education of their children to teachers. They thought that, look, the teacher had the ultimate responsibility when it comes to educating the child because after I've paid for a fees. Mm -hmm. But today, if you listen to Doc, you have parents to have to be very, very much what? Involved. Mm -hmm. And not just involved, they will have to appreciate the work that the teacher does. So I think that this COVID-19, bad as it is, it's more or less uh, serves as a means of an awakening call to Ghanaians that, look, education is very, very important, even though there's been a lot of investment when it comes to educational infrastructure, but there needs to be a sense of what? Agency. Mm -hmm. You go to schools today, the president is saying that, look, we should have 25 people, 30 people. Look, my brother, go to Bolga 
Presby Primary. Don't class go too one. Far. We have about 100 don't, people in a class. Don't go too far to Borga. <laughs> I think even Great <laughs> Chile here and Big Base, that is it. those communities here in the Greater Accra region have this problem. And Solomon Azakaria has joined us at Zoom as well. He uh, is the uh, Regional Education Adv Advisor at Oxfam. Thank you, Suleiman, for joining us. You, I know you've been following this conversation on this. We're looking at a forward-moving conversation. This is where we are. What do we do going forward to improve the various elements that COVID-19 has impacted in our education setting? Suley. Thank you very much. Um, if you would allow me, I'll comment a little Great. on the, the assessment I make of the virtual learning platforms that have been rolled out uh, by government. I think uh, it is a commendable initiative, and as indicated by my colleagues on the uh, on uh, on this program, uh, it comes with limitations, and those limitations are excluding quite significant numbers of children from the sustained learning process that is intended uh, behind these virtual learning programs. Um, you asked the question about. Um, access and monitoring in homes where you have literate parents who for COVID-19 restrictions were at home, the children had the benefit of support from their parents to monitor how they followed the lessons and to support where it was necessary. In many parts of rural Ghana, children didn't have this opportunity because they are born to illiterate parents who could not offer any support. In fact, that is even on the assumption that they were able to access the television and online platforms. The majority of them didn't have access. They didn't have access to televisions. They do not have access to computers. And um, they are unable to even pay for the cost of using these devices. Um, the other limitation that I see, and that has been witnessed all around, is that learning becomes much more effective when it becomes interactive. And in many of these uh, uh, programs, the learning was one way. Uh, of course, in some private institutions, as Dr. Ginapo indicated, uh, some teachers are able to illustrate or make presentations of a topic and then send exercises to children to uh, do and re resend it through WhatsApp to be marked. But the majority of Ghanaian students and children in basic schools do not have access to this, especially those in public schools who are living in rural communities. The other limitation that is quite worrying is the fact that in all of these discussions, we seem not to be bringing to the fore our uh, social cultural settings. As again, especially in rural areas where children have quite a burden in carrying out household chores, especially the girl child. So even in circumstances where they have access to television, their roles in supporting household livelihoods does not permit them to access the learning programs on time. So um, commendable as uh, technology is, and I want to agree with all the panelists, that uh, learning using technology devices will become part of the new normal. And that um, we have just started, we need to learn about the challenges and to see how we make it accessible to every mm -hmm. category of learners. We'll have to, we may have to complement television lessons, online lessons, with very effective radio lessons. And in all of this, we would have to find opportunities for these lessons to be interactive and to be in a way that it can be monitored. 
Hmm. The other issue that I think we need to focus on is that everyone is doing what he or she can. Schools are doing what they can. How does this feed into a kind of a national framework? For example, if we're in COVID for 10 months, at the end of the 10 months, at what level would we regard students or would we consider students learning? This is something we will have to think about and have a national framework which is properly resourced and which will tell us that should COVID-19 continue and should we continue to use technology-based learning devices at the end of X number of months, mm. this is the learning achievement we expect of children at grade, every grade uh, in the basic school level, as well as uh, uh, senior high school and then the tertiary level. Uh, the last point I would like to make on this is that because of the challenge, current challenges we have with technology, mm -hmm. the likelihood of us finding solutions will lie in private companies that have advanced education technologies. The majority of these have profit orientation. So whilst we look for solutions from everywhere, including the corporate world, we will have to be careful that we don't allow what we call disaster capitalism, that we don't give the opportunity for private sector to dominate the provision of education, which is supposed to be done by government, mm. at a cost. Once the cost element is introduced, it will lead to much more exclusion. Yes, so the private sector is clearly a partner, but we have to be careful about the, how, how, we, uh, how we engage with them with the view that we can use the technologies to improve learning, we can use it to complement learning, but at the end of the day, whatever we are using of the private sector should not lead to further exclusion and inequalities in education, which has bigger implications on inequalities in our society. Mm -hmm. and, and I agree with you perfectly on this because if you're proud to, to this, the inequalities in, in education were already there. And so COVID and those interventions, if not properly managed, maybe also may lead to uh, increasing these inequality levels. But, but so though, let, let me come to you now uh, at this point. Now we've identified accessibility interactivity and monitoring as one of the areas we really need to pay attention to if these measures are going to be part of our education going forward. Obviously the case. But from what you mon monitored and, and what do you think going forward should be paid attention to so that we can respond to the challenges of COVID effectively? You, you, you can unmute. You can unmute now. Hello? Yes, you, you muted. So if you could, yes, yeah, great. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah, um, we've seen a practical challenge. One of the practical challenges where I have to be off, as uh, Dr. Jinapo <laughs> said. And I, I, I think that I, I agree with all the suggestions that have been made, particularly with uh, Mr. Zakaria's uh, disaster capitalism issue, which we need to pay particular attention to. But in addition to this, I think that to promote interaction, interactivity in our teaching use of um, internet, there is a need for skill development. Our teachers themselves, as at now many of them, it's try and error. You know, so we need a scheme that will develop the skills of using um, internet and in promoting online teaching and learning. That is very critical. So the Ministry of Education needs to, I mean, 
invest much money in, in skills development in the use of these things. Then the other one I think we need to do, yes, now we have many school children, uh, many are now using smartphones, parents are helping them in all, using all these things. But now that the lockdown is off and parents will be resuming duty and children, many of whom will be home because they don't fall within the category that will be going to school, they will be left on their own. What do we put in place to ensure that they do not use the access to internet to explore other unhealthy knowledge, which eventually will place them in, 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 in will affect their security. Mm. That is also one thing I think we need to do. So the two things, developing skills and then protecting the young ones, even us, we, we, we use this. It's very important. This is what I want to add to. Great. Developing skills and protecting your young ones. Doc, I'll come to you on this because that's an area you are very passionate about. How do we protect the young ones while we, we now accept the fact that e-learning is going to be an integral part of the education process? Yeah. Protecting the young ones is, is, is not going to be an easy task. And again, like um, I had said, the bulk of the work now has been shifted to parents, parents who probably don't have who time probably to don't have, have to go time to work because they still have to go to work they are they are all over the place making money to buy smartphones for their children so it's it's going to be um uh, it's going to be quite a tax mm -hmm. parents must be available parents must inculcate um, now the owners on parents to inculcate values into their children because you wouldn't be available to police your child every day, mm -hmm. and they may end up acquiring unhealthy knowledge because everything is on the internet so, now. So this is the challenge. It's a challenge. What do we do? What to do? First, it's, it starts by training our children on the right values, making sure that they have healthy morals, they know what is expected. Once they know, mm. they will not depart from the training. And that comes back to monitoring because they normally wouldn't do what they are told. You see, they would... we will not be there to monitor our children throughout their growing period. Mm. So that the, it, it starts with the training. Once the training is done, then monitoring what they do with the internet wouldn't be too much difficult. And you want to come in on this point? You know, mm -hmm. the uh, children are curious by nature. Mm -hmm. I mean, if I were that age now, I also like to explore possibility things that I've never seen before. Mm -hmm. But I agree with you. You know, I had to raise children through the system too. Right. But one of the key things is that there has to be this consistent dialogue between parents and, and kids. Let them begin to understand what is meaningful and what is not meaningful and how they are using their time. You know, again, when it comes to values, I mean, if you look at the, uh, the, the new framework for potential education now, mm -hmm. Values is very critical. Okay. I mean, part of uh, our history, uh, the people who led this uh, country to where we are, mm -hmm. uh, some of the people that you can emulate and so on, all of these are people that have to, uh, we begin to showcase them as the exemplars in society. Mm -hmm. but, uh, but I'm telling you, we cannot guarantee 100% mm -hmm. that children will not drift off into particular places, mm -hmm. you know. But, then the, 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 uh, the, we, but we can't give up on that one. That part of education is key. That... This is our country. And I'll be honest with you, Ghana is one of the most beautiful countries that I've seen. Mm -hmm. And children need to begin to accept that. And my question, I always come back to the school again, that the school should be the exemplar. This is, this is where we're going to be. Right. This is how hygienic it's going to be. This is where the values are. And these are values that, are, that have been brought up through the, uh, the uh, uh, schools of education, where the teachers themselves begin to understand these mm -hmm. values and so on. So we are at, a, uh, we're at an inflection point where we can't go on living the way that we've lived in the past. Yes. Things are changing. We have children at our, uh, our disposal. We have ch children at our care. How do we ourselves become exemplary as role models for society? Mm. Many times we, we, uh, we blame children for some of our own ailments. Yes. But the time has come now where we begin to understand that we have to model the right behaviors. You know, mm. so that uh, if we lie, 
we know that we are teaching them to lie. to lie. Right. If we are unhygienic, we are teaching them to be unhygienic. So the onus is on the adults in society that going forward, what society do we want? Mm. And what part are we going to play? Children mm. are only a manifestation of the larger issues in society, but we tend to blame them, you know? And again, <laughs> back to uh, where sites where we, uh, they don't need to go, how can we block those sites? That's another way to look at it. And this all goes back to education. So parents get to know. Prof, I'm going to come back to you on the point of measuring the level of assimilation and understanding if we're using e-learning or if we're going to have to adopt e-learning as COVID-19 uh, for as long as we will live with us. How do we then improve on the process of assessing the level of understanding that the child has through the television uh, channel that the GS is doing now or the radio education channel or any other channel apart from the face-to-face -face interaction with the teacher? Yeah, I, I think one of the things that we need to do uh, is to make inter interaction key in the teaching learning process. For instance, before COVID, I didn't know that Zoom has a provision where group meetings, Zoom meetings could be held. For well, that's true, though. Here, but not, not, to, not to interrupt you, but the Zoom, I mean, know. was relied on mostly from our own analysis by these private elite schools, right? How about the public basic junior high schools that had to rely on the GES t TV and the radio? How does interaction yeah. occur there when there's just a one-way form of communication? Yeah, that is what I'm, I'm using Zoom as, as a model to suggest that our ICT technicians, experts, need, especially those who are skilled in soft, software, should actually invest, try to come out with softwares that will help our TV stations and other virtual media houses to engage children, to provide children the means of interacting where the child in the school can ask questions directly. Our radio, if it's radio program, there must be an opportunity for the child to ask questions. There must be an opportunity where the child, after going through uh, the, 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 the lesson and then working on assignment, can actually share that assignment. And I think that it is a responsibility that our technologists need to focus on now. This COVID is now testing our capacity to be innovative, our capacity to be creative. And this is the opportunity where our te technicians need to be supported to come out with uh, issues, uh, things that will help us address that. So that will be my suggestion that we can learn from the Zoom model and see how best we can transfer it down so that our TV stations, our radio stations will make their presentations interactive enough. And it all boils down to accessibility. And I'll come to you, uh, so, well, I think, uh, well, Zachariah, let me come, it all boils yeah. down to this. Because you see, it's, it's okay to say that, yes, we can explore Zoom, but talk about it. Look, a, a parent in, in, in a house, let's take the average Ghanaian at the basic level. The cost of data alone, and uh, you have parents complaining, 100 CDs data per session for their children on Zoom. Even though there was some provision of data by these telcos to, to the, the ministry, it didn't reach that level of the rural areas. How practical will this proposal be if we have to explore improving interactivity through the employment of these channels for as long as COVID lives with us? Uh, um, thank you very much. Um, I think that um, we would have to explore technology uh, quite carefully and then um, work with those who have the capacity, as Dr. Odro indicated. Um, I, I, they, you, you asked a question about how uh, parents who are out of home can monitor what their children use their devices for. 
Uh, I think those who are tech savvy are capable of helping those who can afford to monitor what is happening while they are away. Well. But the practicality of it is another question because the parents will be away at work and working. How much time will they have to set aside to monitor what is happening? And as far as this is concerned, I see it being limited to urban rich who are quite capable of affording these devices and paying for the data. But what is most important is that I think uh, the greater majority of the, of, of the Ghanaian child is in the public school. The greater majority of children who are outside the school system mm -hmm. will do better if they have access to public education systems. It could be directly in the school, it could be outside the school using technology. And this has to be borne by government because of these obvious limitations that one, people don't have access to internet. Right. Of course, television is television has a quite a wide coverage. Many people don't have access to televisions. If you have the opportunity of driving through rural communities, even in some urban communities, you can find as many as 20, 30 people crowded around one single television. True. How can learning take place. take place in this? So we are talking about making access to television easy for the majority or all of the children who are learning. In the absence of that, we should be talking about how do we use radio because mm -hmm. that is not as expensive as uh, television and that is quite affordable and available in many communities but even with that right there are families that do not have access to radio so going forward if we recognize the complementarity of technology in sustaining learning we would have to find ways of building these into the national education development plans and budgets mm. and making sure that we reach everybody with the technology. Thank you. We've but, been talking. Um, I would like to, I would like, I'd just like to quickly add that given our level of development in terms of technology and access and uh, ICT infrastructure and even the skills of parents, teachers in ICT, which is quite low, um, I do not see the technology replacing the school system. Right. Maybe we play a complementary role in, in that regard. But that's exactly. why I, I just wanted to bring in Mrs. Charles uh, Sowa, uh, who is the administrator of the Parent Teachers Association. Mr. Sowa, if, if you can hear me, if you could position your camera well uh, so I could, I could see you fully. Hello, Mr. Sowa. Well, these are some of the challenges we, we, we need to accept that it's going to be with us. Ms. Oa, can you hear me? If you can unmute, because you, you are yet to connect to the audio. No, please connect to the audio so you can hear me. No, your audio is not connected. I'm seeing it right there on my screen, but... Well, these are some of the limitations we have to deal with. But that's it. But Dr. Jenna, before I need to come in, Dr. these, we're dwelling on challenges and how to go about, you know, um, solving them going forward. The practical ways of improving uh, interactivity is, is key if we have to sustain these interventions uh, going forward. How do we do this? Well, I think, uh, let, let me take it from where Mr. Zakaria ended, that... Uh, Technology or e-learning is supposed to complement traditional teaching and learning. Yes. And I think uh, I go back to the topic that we are discussing beyond COVID-19. Mm -hmm. It looks as if there's... COVID-19 and beyond. And beyond. It looks as if there's some kind of uh, 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 traction uh, towards e-learning, which is a very good thing. But 
it's important for listeners and viewers to know that when we talk about education, it shouldn't be limited to just depositing knowledge into the heads of the individual. Mm. It's not a banking system where you, you just feed the person with information mm. and when you need it, you take it back. We are talking of positive behavioral change. And if we talk about positive behavioral change, that human contact is extremely important. Mm. The way you dress, the way you talk. In fact, the teacher is seen as what? A model, a role model. So, I, when I go to class, I have a class of about, let's say, 500 people. I refuse to stand in front of the lecture hall. I try to walk in to give them eye contact. It's very, very important. Walking between the roads. Walking in between the roads. That is why even in the most advanced countries, technology has not replaced traditional teaching and learning. Mm. So but, I but think the challenge that COVID... The challenge that it has brought, mm -hmm. it tells you that, number one, technology is very important and we are not sufficiently... I mean, prepared when it comes to our technological what, infrastructure. Two, today as we speak, I think water is free, right? Mm -hmm. Water is free. Yes, until any And time. it tells you the importance of water when it comes to fighting viruses and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. Go to most of our schools. How many of these rural schools have even hand washing water, water to drink? Mm -hmm. Just water to drink. I've seen schools where the children, when they want to ease themselves, they have to go to the bush. Mm -hmm. It tells you that we lack a lot when it comes to what? Our educational infrastructure. So we need to do a lot when it comes to weight. Mm -hmm. We need to provide water. And, we and, need to and good sanitary conditions good are sanitary, imperative that is it. now that, more than that, ever. That is it. If they so, have to go so, back to school. So, uh, Alfred, I think uh, there's a saying that with every misfortune comes what? A, a blessing. blessing. But unfortunately, unfortunately, when it comes to this part of our world, when we are confronted with these things, we talk about it. When it's over, then, I mean, business as usual. I, I, I hope and pray that uh, based on the enormity of effects of COVID-19, we should not do the business as usual. Uh, we should take this as an opportunity to, to seriously look at our infrastructure in the sense that today, I mean, whether we like it or not, I mean, children will still go back to school. There's no doubt about mm -hmm. it. Children will go back to school. Do we have the necessary uh, 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 go back in safety? In safety, can they do that in safety? Yeah, I think with we, what we're confronted with. I think with look, let's, let's not let's not pretend that when children go back to school, even as as we speak, the few who are going, we will definitely have cases in the schools. Yeah. We need to brace ourselves for it. We need to we brace would, ourselves. Yeah, we will have cases in the schools. There's no doubt about it, and that is why if you look at the government policy, they've made provisions for that. All yeah. these schools are connected to what? Various health facilities and all yes. this. So I don't want a situation whereby people will say that, oh, we told you so, that you should have opened the schools. Schools will definitely have to be open one way or the other. Mm -hmm. Schools will have to be opened. And even though it is being done gradual, it will get to a point in time that from KG1 up to university will have to be opened. There's no doubt about it. The caveat it. is in safety because we all agree. Yes, yes. in safety. But, but you can never, can never have 100% safety. Of our lives. You can never mm -hmm. have 100% safety. Yeah. I'm looking at adequately what? Prepared. There's no way that we can have 100%. The only time that we can have 100% is if we have a vaccine for the virus. Mm -hmm. But if we don't have it, we must brace ourselves for the spread of the virus and we will be prepared to what? To deal with it. Schools will have to be open at a point in time. Mm -hmm. And I always tell people, look, as we speak... How, how do we do it? For example, in a class, a basic class of, say, 50 children in a class, I've seen that in, in, in rural Accra, mm -hmm. not to talk about the other uh, rural communities across the country. 50 children in a class, you, you have to do social distancing. You're already seeing something at the junior high level where, as part of the protocols, all classes are to be split with not more than 30 That's students it. in a class. Immediately you have two people, mm -hmm. two people meeting. The probability of one getting the virus is there. So even if you have five people, people can get it. So we are talking about 50. Yes, it reduces the risk as compared to what, 300. But mm -hmm. if I teach at the university, and the policy says that the university, you're supposed to cut the class size into half. I teach about 600 students. I'm going to meet 300 students. And not as if I'm meeting 300. As the 300 students are meeting them, while they are leaving, there's another 300 struggling to come in. Mm -hmm. 
So the chances of I getting it is high. But should schools be shut down forever because of fear of getting it? I don't think that's the way for it. Uh, you know, when you are in a school of education, one of the most important courses that you take is safety and hygiene. It will be very difficult in our circumstances to prevent the, the spread. But our best option is hygienic conditions. So that, that, that speaks to something that Nkrumah started. I mean, when I was growing up, where they have Ministry of Information vehicles that go from village to village mm -hmm. to show best practices, yes. how you wash your hands and so on. Unfortunately, we haven't continued that. Mm -hmm. So that if you go, all you have to do is walk outside uh, any of our public schools or even communities where we live, mm -hmm. and you realize that we tend to be aloof. I mean, it's a cultural thing that we have to begin to understand. Mm -hmm. We all tend to be aloof yes. about the hygienic conditions. But, but, then, but then, but then, we expect someone to come and clean our dirt for us. You see, that is where the hypocrisy is. That here we are. Again, look, parents come to me to say, um, "I want my children to go to school uh, A, B, or C. Which one?" And I say, "Go to the go to the school and find out for yourself the hygienic conditions there. Is it a place where you want to deposit your kids?" But I'll tell you what: some parents don't care. You know. And then what, what, uh, what I'm told is that, look, this is how we were raised up mm -hmm. to accept these unhealthy conditions. Mm -hmm. But the point is this. This is how we were raised up. Now we know that this is not what we need. So what is it that we're going to do? Mm -hmm. So again, the work of the district assemblies is very, very important. You know, mm -hmm. every community should be brought up to speed. And part of what we have to do with the Minister of Information, Minister of Communication and Television programs like yours is that, Health is number one, mm -hmm. you know? And we cannot expect that as someone who's going to clean, uh, clean our mess for us. You know, many times we expect manna to drop out of heaven, but the, the magic, the miracles are right at our fingertips. What is it that we're going to do to elevate our own standards? Those are the values that we're talking about. Mm. And if the kids cannot pick those values at home, then they need to pick those values at school. school. But the school itself has to be exceptional. The school has to be exemplary. That this is what we're talking about in terms of health. The exceptionality and the exemplary standards are enforced. Schools mostly wouldn't just mm -hmm. adhere to it. Mm -hmm. That's what comes back to the point about how then do we make sure that the health and safety standards do not only become <laughs> a requirement on paper, <laughs> but then the district education directors and the other players at the local level are empowered enough to do the monitoring. Doc? You see, empowering them comes with logistics. And we have more public schools than private schools True. in this country. Unfortunately, the public schools that should have been the model schools in the country are the worst um, 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 resource with logistics. Okay. So you go to the public schools, they don't have... Um, toilet facilities, the classrooms are congested, they don't have healthy... Some private schools still don't, actually. Some private schools don't. Maybe not on the large Yes, but, but then the bulk is, uh, lies with the public schools. So we must start resourcing our public schools, and indeed our, our private schools as well. And so those infrastructures are put in place, then we cannot be sure that we are ready to curb the, the, the spread of the virus. What different are we going to do? Um, because this is something that's lived with us. I mean, we didn't need COVID to let us know how important hygiene is for and our now children. Now, COVID has taught us that it's very, very important. Very, very important. Very quickly, I think the whole thing is lack of commitment. Mm. Lack of commitment. We are very good at making policies, but we suck when it comes to what? Enforcing them. Mm. I remember when we were kids. You come to parade early in the morning, they check your fingernails. Mm -hmm. uh, sometimes they used to check your teeth. Mm -hmm. That was the norm. And in the morning, you have, you, have, you, have a, you have a plot. You have a plot that you sweep every day. That was those days. Today, we don't do it because times have changed. In fact, we have schools that uh, children don't sweep. We have cleaners who clean the place. Mm -hmm. but, it was all the, the yes, we have the cleaners who clean the place. Not but I think not, that not subjecting the children that to children too much work. So that, is it. that is the truth of the matter is that it's not as if the authorities 
like they, they are not ready to enforce it or like they, they are not aware of it. But it starts from the, the, the top. If whoever is at the top is not making sure that the regional director ensures that these things are done, there's no way that it's going to be done. And beyond that, if you say that uh, we need to have hygiene, you come to my school at Fufusu, there's no pipe. Mm. What should be done? There needs to be an alternative mechanism. Children should bring water to what? To school. If children are bringing water to school, they end up the whole day going to fetch water. So how do you expect the children to what? To wash their hands and all those kind of things. That is why I said COVID-19 has exposed a lot of things when it comes to our educational infrastructure. Yeah. It has exposed a lot of things. In the sense that, I quite remember when Ebola came. Even though Ghana, we never suffered from Ebola. Hand sanitizers were promoted. After Ebola, did you hear anything about hand sanitizers? No. No. Today, so, if you are entering the church or any public premise, there's water with soup for us to wash our hands. Why? Because we are running away from what? Coronavirus. <laughs> Didn't we need that before? We've had Corolla and all those kind of things. Well, so as I said, I'm looking at how sustainable the measures that oh. we've put in place will what will be mm. post COVID-19. Because something else will come. We've had instances where people have died of Corolla in this country. <laughs> Absolutely. Honest, you know, what, what comes to my mind <clears throat> is what I call the best practices. What is it that we can learn from other people? And then the, uh, the, uh, uh, when we had the soccer competition and the, uh, the, the Japanese had to participate and they lost, these Japanese went back to the lockers and cleaned up. And cleaned up. Mm -hmm. They left the place cleaner than when they found it. Sure. That's culture. Where did they learn it from? They learned it from well, right from the beginning. Mm -hmm. And then this is not something that's new to us. Again, when I was in class one, 19, in the 1950s, our school was special for us. So we, we made sure that we were growing uh, flowers. And when we grew flowers and the goats came to eat the flowers, now we went to the bush to cut bamboo. We were in class one, it was, the only, it was uh, about 30 of us in this little school. But then we lived in a mud house. So when we came to the school, the school was sacrosanct. It was, it was uh, an epitome of what life should be. So we grew flowers around it. The goats eat the flowers, you go cut the bamboos, so that now we put, uh, how do you call it, a bamboo wall all around the school. The school was very important to us. Why don't we have that now? Again, and that's what I come with parents. That's what I come with parents again. Here you are, going to deposit your child in this particular environment. Especially if it's a girl who is in a period. What are they supposed to do? And we are aloof about it. You know, again, the, there's a program too that I do, Ghana National Association of Private Schools, mm -hmm. NAPS, and we're promoting a reading culture. And then you ask yourself, the noise levels that we create in the communities, where is a child going to sit with a peace of mind to concentrate, to read one paragraph or two paragraphs, and we all pretend these things don't happen. It's there. Absolutely. And parents should be right there with them. I, I was in Agbobloshi two weeks ago. There's a, there's a basic school in the heart of Agbobloshi. Mm -hmm. They pay two CDs a day. And all the blaring noises going on in there. And children are supposed to concentrate mm -hmm. to learn. It's, it's supposed to be a private school where they take the money on a daily basis to pay the teachers. But it comes back to individual responsibility. I think that's what Anis is hammering <laughs> on. So yes, if the school has limitations, the home must now bridge that gap. Yeah. How do we do this? The home must bridge the gap. And once it's the home, then parents must be seen as doing that. Unfortunately, our parents claim to be too busy to take you care of their children. Too busy to take care of their children. It is the same money that you COVID has taught us that the teachers cannot train Thank you. the children for us. Mm. So parents must make time. As much as making the money is important, parents must know that their children are equally important, even more important than what they go out to do there. So they must devote bulk of their time with their children, teaching them what to do. I think balance, balance is a principle that cuts across every aspect mm. of life. 
But let, let, Doc, let, yeah, let me take it from where Doc uh, uh, ended and go back to your Abu Bulishi example, mm -hmm. where you indicated that there's a school the hub. in the hub of noise in Abu Bulishi. Mm -hmm. The parents pay two CDs every day. It tells you something. Number one, those parents have no choice. Yes. The kind of people who are in Abu Bulushi are mostly, regrettably, Kayayu people from very poor backgrounds who, in fact, they cannot live in anywhere apart from that quote unquote slum. And if they are living in that slum, their children have to go to school. Mm -hmm. And that is where they can situate the school. Mm -hmm. Secondly, why are they paying two CDs every day? Because they cannot have the accumulated school fees. It tells you how poor they are. So if that Kayayu girl does not go to carry a day, the child will not go to school the next day. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. If she goes to carry and she is not able to make enough income, her child will not go to school the next day. So what this tells you is that it tells you how weak our social welfare system is. Social mm -hmm. welfare system. If we had a very strong, robust social welfare system, there would have been a good school somewhere where buses can well, pick these children, take them to school, so that the mother will not even bother. Mm -hmm not to go to work a day or not. And that is why I keep going back to the fact that, look, COVID-19, as bad as it is, has yes. taught so us a lot of lessons. Mm -hmm. It has told us that, look, our infrastructure from every corner, infrastructure yes. at every corner, has a problem. And it's even more damning when it comes to our education infrastructure. And the, going forward, you see, it's, it's a lot more about when getting to know the lessons and actually learning from the lessons. And implementing the, the and lessons. Implementing yeah. the, the measures from the lessons to ensure we don't get back to this point. And that's why we've been making proposals along the line as we've been having this conversation. But I want us to identify specific measures that uh, you, you want to see. Going forward, what, what I want to see is this: <clears throat> we have extreme cases like the Abu case that we're mm -hmm. talking about, mm -hmm. but not all cases are like that. Mm -hmm. There are some places where there can be preventive measures. So I think we should go back to 1957. You should go back, go back mm -hmm. to 1957 and learn from that, where mm -hmm. the Ministry of Information goes from place to place, letting people understand what hygiene is, because sometimes we don't know. In fact, in some schools where you even uh, bring in the uh, toilet bowls. People don't know how to use them. So what mm. I'm saying is this. We have to now begin to educate everybody that hygiene is number one. Mm. And there are basic things that we can do to prevent it. You know, basic cleanliness, where we throw rubbish anywhere, where uh, we defecate anywhere, and that sort of thing. The, these things are now coming out. But then that's our best prevention against any kind of disease. And unfortunately, like my brother is saying, COVID-19 is bringing us to speed in terms of what it is that we need to do. But the key is hygiene. We can't, we can't, uh, we can't emphasize that enough. How, how do we, uh, uh, the hygienic practices, and hygienic practices are there on paper, in textbooks. Okay, but what about the practice? We need to really begin to focus on that on a national level. That this is a beautiful country, but we can't go on living like that. I mean, even if you look at Galamsey, places where there's, water, where there's no water, but we've destroyed it, mm -hmm. you know? So what I'm saying is this, we need to begin to look inward. And number one, accept that Ghana is one of the most beautiful countries in the world, but what are we doing with it? Mm -hmm. These are the questions that have to be raised. And it has to be a national effort, Ministry of Communication, Ministry of Information, radio, uh, television stations like you and so on, and say this is a beautiful country, and this is how we expect things to be. Starting with the schools where we should not be growing trees and growing flowers. Kids sit in the dust. They eat in the dust and so on. Are we going to accept that? So parents now should begin to take their children seriously. That a child is God's gift to us. Mm -hmm. How are we going to protect the children? Because again, let me say this. It's in our own selfish interest to make sure that we take care of the children. Because when we get older, who's going to take care of us? They. My, my last point is this. I took my mother to Confarnoche Hospital uh, because her legs were were given. Mm -hmm. You won't believe this. The doctor I saw there was one of my former students. Wow. So what I'm saying is this, in our own selfish interest, mm -hmm. to begin to understand that what we let out in society is exactly what comes back to us. Mm -hmm. 
And we should not depend on just a few other people doing these things for us. It has to be a national sure. effort. That should be a national, and the, and the point you made earlier about the private sector participation in the way forward, that's what um, uh, Zakaria Suleiman made the point that we should be careful not to allow disaster capitalization or profiteering. In this. How do we have the private sector support these interventions to sustain education going forward without having them, you know, capitalize? We are, we are not at the point yet. Where we may get there. We, we are not at a point yet where we want to look at private participation as a disaster. Private companies are successful. Why? Because they use best practices. So what we have to do is begin to collaborate with them. Mm -hmm. They are not going to take over the school. They are going to share with us some of their own best practices. And also where they can be useful in some way. But we are not asking them to take over the public schools. Public schools are number one. Uh, if, if you look at uh, any social contract, Public school is one of the key elements there. But we have to begin to bring in others who have the expertise, who have the resources to help. And they are not there to, uh, to take over the school. So I'm not at that point yet. I don't think we are there at all. Mm -hmm. Let, let's bring them in first. Let's see how we can work with them. Let's see how we can cooperate with them. And then we can take it from there. But I would say, what, what, what are so the, the, the specific you know, uh, proposals that, that you want to see feeding into sort of a national framework for uh, education in COVID-19 and beyond, taking into consideration the challenges that we're faced with now? Yeah, I think um, the first will be creating a conducive environment in all schools in terms of running water, water to wash hands, just cleanliness. Hygiene is key mm -hmm. to fight this COVID. Hygiene is key. And the first... I will, I will want to see is having a healthy environment in which our children can, can thrive. So that's the first. Then secondly, to hammer on the education that um, my colleague has been talking about, we need to continuously educate our children on um, ways in which they can prevent the spread of, of um, the COVID. Because just telling them to wear the mask will not work at the basic level. Mm. I can't imagine children in KG1 being masked and keeping the masks on in class. Huge challenge. So the education must go on. And it starts with just basic hygiene. Washing your hands, mm -hmm. not touching um, surfaces unnecessarily. And then making provision for, for washing their hands and then um, sanitizing them. Because the children cannot also be entrusted to keep their own sanitizers. So these things should be available at the schools mm. for, for the children to so use. Jennifer, how, how do learners reclaim lost time? I mean, if, if eventually the easing gets to phase two, for example, where the basic now have a certain level of access to the classroom, and even the GHS 3 and SHS who are going now, SHS, we know that six weeks have been given for some sort of mopping up. But what do we do? I think uh, it depends on the level. It depends on the level. And when I say it depends on the level, we are talking of about four different facets of the educational enterprise. We are talking of uh, kindergarten, primary, uh, GHS, SHS, and uh, the university. At the university level, I know for a fact that there are some schools that are being organizing, uh, what do they call it, online, online teaching. My school, for instance, happens to do that, and it cuts across all levels, from level 100 to level 400. Um, definitely, some students will be left out. There's no doubt about it. Mm -hmm. Some students will be left out. There might be the opportunity being provided them in terms of face-to-face -face teaching. I mean, teaching can be done during the weekends and all those kind of things. But the truth of the matter is that some aspects of the syllabus definitely will not be what, will not be covered. When it comes to the primary level, as I indicated, there are some lessons that have been sent through WhatsApp and all those things. But mm -hmm. Alfred, I think we need to start from the premise that, yes, some syllables might not be covered, mm -hmm. but it, it, it doesn't mean that is the end of what? Of life, or that is the end of education. We must, we must do with it. We must deal with we'll it. Be able to move on. That we must move on. Because I always say that, look, Education should not be limited to how much information you absorb. That is not what education is all about. Mm. Even though you are supposed to be prepared to go and write exam, 
But the most important and critical thing is that to what extent have you been what? Changed positively, mm. which is very, very important. And that is where I believe that this COVID-19 uh, is going to teach parents uh, a lesson to understand and appreciate the services that teachers what? <laughs> Provide for the money that they want, they pay. Because, mm. look, my brother, I stay in the house with my kids and I know what I go through. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> let, let me just say that we, we, right. we, we had <laughs> the uh, NOOCS president and some other um, student unions actually joining us on Zoom. Um, we lost contact with them. You can actually connect again and we'll do a brief one with you. But the Chalsoa is, is back. I hope Mr. you can hear me now. Hello, yes, I can hear you. Right. Great. <laughs> now, a lot of responsibility, uh, at least from the conversation we've been having, I know you've been following on the television, is now on, on the parents. What kind of conversation is a PTA having um, to ensure that between now, COVID and beyond, parents actually get to understand what they have to do and are able to do what is expected of them as well during this period? Okay, thank you very much. Um, it's, it's, it's a huge responsibility because this COVID... Hello, can you hear me? I can hear you clearly, please. Yes. Yes, it's a huge responsibility now on parents and even beyond. Should the Lord yes. be uh, 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 His grace fall on us and then the COVID eases off completely. One thing is that parents have now seen the need to ensure that because with this COVID-19 pandemic, when children began to stay home, when they should have stayed in school, we have realized that a whole lot of things have come up. Whilst we are saying that children, uh, the reopening must um, be done with a, a, a piecemeal approach, we are also thinking of the Form 3 students, that is, those who are supposed to go to, uh, to write the exams and then and leave. Right. What can we do? We believe that we made our input and the government has actually listened to us. Now, what we have to do is to support government. Mm. Supporting government means that every, um, what do you call it, uh, measure that has been put in place that students ought to adhere to, not only students, but even parents and then the teachers, all of us will have to work, ensure that that is done. And we need to work actually continuously educate our children to adhere to all these, rest uh, what do you call it, um, uh, measures. Mm -hmm. Going beyond that, uh, earlier on I had the discussion about uh, this e-learning and then the use of uh, technology. Right. And I was, I was so impressed what the panelists um, said. And I think that the two would have to go together. We okay. are in a, 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 a technological world today. And we cannot completely say that we will not allow uh, our children. What we have to do is to put the two together as we, as society, as a society, we look at the rules mm. set as, as guidelines right. for these children. For instance, you cannot say that you allow a child in AG or a class four, class three to use the internet for what? But we know that the JHS app to SS and the university can use it for research. There okay. is the fear that, oh, these children may misuse it and go to areas where they are not supposed to go. And that is where monitoring comes in. Great when they point. are in school, the teachers can actually monitor them. Right. It may not be all the, the time, but we think that there can be some restriction. While the child is in school, there is this school, uh, IT platforms mm. or centers in the schools where they can go and use the, uh, the, the, uh, the internet to do their research. Great. Thank but you so much. Home, parents all to work also mm. continue to monitor them. And I think with that, we can do so. I am we grateful. Can, we can do well. I'm, I'm really and grateful for, 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 for these. Uh, I thank you so much. Mr. Chasoa is administrator of the Parent Teacher Association Councillors PTA. And the whole conversation has been about the responsibility 
parents also have in all of this. And uh, really, this is just a first phase of this national dialogue. And that's how we, we end it. On the note of the proposals that you make, hopefully, uh, I will culminate into sort of a national framework policy on how to deal with the challenges that COVID-19 has presented to us and beyond. I would want to thank those who joined us on Skype. Unfortunately, the uh, student unions, we couldn't connect with you, uh, who joined us on Zoom. I want to thank you so much uh, for the patience and also following the conversation to the virtual audience also who watched us on TV3, uh, various media general platforms. Thank you very much for watching us. Thank you, Dr. Abujina Paul, former head of department, Early Childhood Education, University of Winneba. Uh, oh, thank you so much, Doc, for making the time to be here. I also thank uh, Anissa Farr, who's uh, an educationist, teacher, founder of Gate Institute, council member of the Ghana Education Service. Nice. As always, thank you very much for making the time to be with us. I also want to thank Dr. Anna Osir Mensa, who is the director of the Royal School, also a former university lecturer. I want to thank you so much, madam, for making the time to be with us. And to you out there, we've got lots of your messages as well. All this with the support of Oxfam Ghana and the Foundation for Security and Development Studies, geared towards we getting the right approach to dealing with the challenges that COVID-19 has presented us now and beyond. On behalf of the rest of the team here making all of this possible, I want to say thank you so much.